Okay, everyone, welcome back to the Black Carnivore podcast. And I am really excited today to bring you uh, Bitten Johnson, who is from Sweden. And um, she is, I first it came across her years ago, you know, as I look to find a way to deal with my, you know, my carb cravings and understand why like sugar just had this unbelievable hold on me. And lo and behold, I found someone who understood what that feeling was like and understood what sugar addiction, you know, truly is and um, really gave incredible insight and in how to kind of wrestle this monster and and, um, and helped me a lot along the way. And so I'm really excited to hear what she has to say, what wisdom she has to share, and, um, and you know, hopefully can help all of you. Because I know I hear people say all the time, oh, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm like addicted to sugar and, you know, it's like crack for me. And it's like, actually, it really is. So let's dive yeah. right in. Pitten, please sure. share with us. Sure. Shoot. So, well, what is this? I mean, I, I do believe that sugar actually changes my brain and, you know, it functions the same way as if I took cocaine or crack or anything else. I think it actually changes my brain and that I am physically addicted to it. But is that possible? People tell me that's not true. You know, Coca-Cola well, tells me, oh, you just got to, you know, moderate how much you have and it's your fault. <laughs> sure, babe. I used to say that to people that, talk about not believing in it or saying it is not real that they should join flat earth society uh, and uh, stay there then until they read up uh, first of all uh, we don't believe in sugar addiction we know it's true today we know uh, and let me tell you i've been doing this for 28 years this october and um, in the beginning you know there were uh, three, four books that really explain this in an excellent way, but there weren't a lot of research behind it, but they saw it, they knew it, they were pretty, pretty sure. I remember reading the book, um, The Hidden Addiction by a doctor, Jan two doctors, Janice Keller Phelps and Alan Norris. She wrote it in the end of eighties. And I said, yeah, this is the way it is. And people came to me and said, you know, and I knew it by myself because when I quit smoking 92, all hell broke loose. And I'm a recovering alcoholic from 1985. So I've been sober for 36 years. Uh, so I know neuroscience and I know addiction medicine. So let's just end that question there. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it, sugar is an incredible, powerful drug. And, and you know that, and we all know that we have to eat. We are wired in that way. We're born in that way. We must eat. And some people say we need sugar. And I said, no. Uh, uh, well, yes and no. Let me say this. The body and the brain runs on sugar, but it, it is a beautiful machine that makes what it needs, and it needs very little compared to today's food. We don't need one milligram, uh, microgram added sugar whatsoever. Uh, and I used to joke and say, you know, there was no Coca-Cola on the trees in Stonehenge. So people survived then too. Uh, there's so much, uh, I think, you know, when it comes to food, religion, and politics, we are so much into feelings, you know, uh, we, we can be bombarded with facts, but still there is feeling. And I belong to that, to those humans too. I'm not different in that way, of course not. But as a nurse, uh, working, you know, in hospitals and with sick people and study medicine and anatomy and all that, um, I would say that I have a little bit heads up on knowing, you know, what kind of fuel we should have. I, sometimes I don't even want to call it food because people get all picture, all kinds of pictures in their head with food, right? Food. And, you know, what's that? What do you call food? Fake meat? Is that food? No way. I mean, that's fake. It's chemical shitstorm. Excuse my French. Um, you know, and the, the vegan burgers and vegan sausages. And if you look at the ingredient list, you, you think you're looking at uh, chips or, you know, some kind of uh, synthetic uh, drug or something. So, and, and I think one of the advantages I've had is, you know, uh, that I have worked with alcoholics, drug addicts and pill addicts and with drugs and pills being a nurse. 
So I come from a little bit of a different angle than those people that only work food addiction and don't understand addiction medicine. To me, uh, you know, I would say the sugar is worse than cocaine and heroin in the way that, think about it, which, are the, which is the first uh, drug the human brain encounters? We don't give heroin and cocaine or alcohol to babies, but we expose them to all this food, you know, all these chemicals and the sugar that is so highly potent, like high fructose corn syrup, which is in everything. I mean, can you find something with a label that is not? Uh, so that is the scary part. And then we have to remember the, the other thing, that brain is not ready. It's not matured. I mean, the prefrontal cortex, which is an extremely important part of your brain, makes you a human, your personality, your capacity for practicing discipline for logic thinking, making uh, decisions, uh, you know, uh, there's so many things going on in prefrontal cortex. It doesn't mature until we are 25, 30. So imagine that brain getting the wrong fuel for years and years and years, and then uh, add that the neurons in your brain the packaging around the neurons, you know, should be of a certain uh, fatty acid composition. And I promise you, it's not canola oil. It is uh, animal fat. We know this for a fact. So that's not to argue with. I mean, you can't argue facts. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of things that people need to know, but one of the things that I think is very important to remember here, I could sit here and preach for hours, right? And you too. Uh, let me put it this way, uh, knowledge gives hope, hope gives willingness, willingness gives action. So what I would like more than being specific on each detail of the science, which, you know, I could buy, yeah, said one thing after the other, this is, blah, blah, blah. Um, I like for the listeners to start looking at themselves, look at their body, listen to their brain. What is your brain saying? What, what does it, what's the chatter and talk in there? Uh, how do you feel in your body? Uh, because what I wanna say is that uh, people that think that they have a battle with food, they are the strongest people. I'm telling you that if I would take one of my patients that tried hundreds of diets and spent thousands of dollars on pills and powders and diets and gym and whatever, uh, a people that doesn't have an addiction, I think they would die if they even tried that. So addicts are very strong people. And I also like to add that the sensitivity we have in our brain that led us to be addicted, that's a superpower. And we think about it as, you know, I'm bad. I'm, uh, I have a bad character. I'm a failure. I can't stick to my diet. I'm doing the wrong things. It is the opposite hey, listen, you got the wrong toolbox. You don't, the right, you don't have the right knowledge. So if you look at yourself like that and think, you know, I really want to be in love with myself, my body, my brain, uh, and I want to care for it in the best way possible. So start getting knowledge. You don't have to take a master's or a PhD, but start picking up little pieces and things there, like listening to you when you uh, do your coaching, you know, and, and uh, that's how I found your Instagram. I saw, ooh, this lady knows what she's talking about. I got to follow her. Uh, I love that. And also the way you approach people, you don't, as I said to you, pussyfoot. You call a spade a spade. And I think that's very important that we are honest and upfront with people. So I say to people, yeah, you have developed an addiction. Yes, it is progressive. It is deadly. It is a horrible illness to have, but if I were to, you know, I almost said sugarcoat, that was a crazy word here, <laughs> but that would be sugarcoating, right? If I were to say, oh yeah, but only if you do this or exercise this, or you eat in moderation, or you do this, what I'm doing is sending you off deeper into your illness. I think that is actually very, very bad of me. So with the speciality I have as an addiction specialist and knowing all these things and thousands of clients, you know, under my belt, 
I'm going to be honest with you, tell you, this is how it is for you. Okay, this is the truth. You can cry, you can scream, you can, you know, I understand that it's grief, it's pain, but I'm here with you. But once you surrender to the fact that you develop this and you can start thinking about your sensitive brain as a superpower, uh, all the strength that's in your body that you can pick up now and with the right toolbox come out into freedom, uh, you know, with, with that knowledge, you can have a very, very happy life, happier than you've ever been. I mean, yeah, people, yeah. my clients write to me and tell me, uh, you know, uh, they say, oh, you saved my life. And I said, no, I didn't. You did it. You did that. I only gave you some tools and some information, but it's up to you to pick it up. I can have the compass and the map. And I said, let's go through the jungle. I show you how you can walk, but you got to walk. You have to walk yourself. I can't carry you. No way. And I can't mm -hmm. feed you. You can't move home to me and be in my kitchen. I can feed you. <laughs> I mean, I think that was like one of the most fundamental things for me is to finally accept that one, this is true. And two, stop being upset that it is true you know yes, uh, i think yes. for so long i spent time like you know why do i you know have this addiction you know what yeah, was the feeling cause? sorry for yourself yeah, yeah. Oh, poor me and, poor me <laughs> no. yeah and I it was so know. much I, easier when i just finally yeah. said you know i i'm not going to give value judgment to anymore this is just a statement of facts and mm -hmm. then i can decide what steps what further steps to take yeah. But I, I do have a question about what you said, um, you know, so one, I think it is, um, I'm so glad you said that word, you know, it's a progressive disease. I yes. think a lot of times we forget that, you know, because yes, we're thinking no. sugar, what, what a big deal, you know, what's the big deal, but addiction always gets worse. And, yes. um, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to, it doesn't lead anywhere good. So every step you can take to try to arrest this or to, uh, you know, reverse it, it mm -hmm. you know, it moves you away from that horrible end. So yes. I, I appreciate that. But I, I loved how you talked about, um, you know, quitting smoking and also alcohol. I do find that, you know, especially, well, maybe it's just for us hardcore uh, you know, sugar addicts that, you know, there are these additional um, addictions. And so I found that when, you know, I used to smoke and drink and everything. And so when I was trying to diet and eat less sugar, I drank more alcohol and some more cigarettes. And so I never felt like I actually got ahead of my addictions. It's just, you know, I had a three legged stool and, you know, just how much Easy. weight each Easy leg was holding. Yeah. 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 And so how do you get beyond that? Well, I tell you what, first of all, you have to understand that it's called addiction interaction disorder today. It's one illness, many outlets. Sugar is the gateway drug. Sugar is what rebuilds or wrongly builds, I rather prefer to say, uh, debuild or whatever we're going to call it, but it does screw up your reward system early, early, early. So I used to uh, I use a lot of metaphors when I teach my clients because that's easier than all the science lingo and all that. So it's like you know sugar is like uh, the uh, ants, a lot of ants starting to do a little trail. That's what start tramping up the trail, <clears throat> and that you know since we are exposed to that all the time every day from we are babies and children until we come to our teens. It's a pretty big way, pretty wide, right? And it's asphalt on it, on top of that, you know, because it's such a powerful drug. So, uh, and then if we take alcohol, it's the same thing for the brain, the reward center. So of course we get hooked on that. Nicotine is the same. And so many, when I was in nursing school, I gained weight, lost weight, gained weight because I was doing all these crazy diets, of course, because I didn't know anything. And then we decided to start smoking to lose weight. Well, I was hooked on <laughs> cigarettes in the jiffy. And then, of course, part of the culture was to go out dancing when you are a bunch of women in nursing school. So then we had to, uh, had to. We, we were grown ups drinking wine. And I loved it. I loved alcohol. So I was an alcoholic within six months. And this is what we see all the time. Let me tell you that it is maybe 
between five or 17% of all addicts, sugar addicts, 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 that have only one outlet. And 80% of all the relapses we see with sugar addiction, people that fall off the wagon, so to speak, with food, is due to hidden unknown outlets like alcohol or nicotine or pills or screens or shopping. I mean, we could go on and on. So I, what, I totally appreciate that. And I'm so glad you said screens because I definitely oh, have gone, a, that's gotten a, too wrapped up in YouTube oh, and, and Instagram oh, and all that. I know. And I tell you what, there is a whole hidden society behind that want us to be on the screens all the time. You have to have all these apps now. You have to log in on everything. If I'm going to report something, a problem in my apartment, I have to log in to you know my landlord's page and i go nuts what did, can't i pick up the phone and call them i mean i i go furious and also if you look at the phones today if you go a few years back if you wanted something on the phone like listen to the answering machine you have to tap it once now you have to tap twice so they want you to sit and tap tap to tap 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 so it is uh a very dangerous, sneaky way of making you be on the screen and going like this with your nose in your phone all day long. Everything should be done there. The latest thing was I had to download the app with my insurance company for my home insurance and my dog insurance. And, you know, it is sick. So this is going to, uh, I mean, gambling addiction, we know about gambling about money. But I think screens, screen addiction is much, much worse. And there was a very, very interesting article about this and how the brain changes from the screen in BBC News, which I usually read, it's a very good paper, a lot of science. So I read that a couple of days ago and I realized, okay, that's a new instrument we need to develop to help people see if they're screen addicted. And, and I wanna stop for a second here. Was, was that answer on your question, by the way? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh good, good. And because can you talk, talk about talking? your, yeah, no, but can you talk about when you answer um, your, uh, you know, why we would need any kind of diagnostic tool for whether we have sugar addiction or screen oh, addiction oh, and what oh. your diagnostic tool is? Cause I don't think everyone's sure. familiar. Yeah, that's very important. Good, thank you. Well, as a nurse, I don't treat guesswork. If you come to me as a nurse and said, I think I have cancer, I don't start bombarding you with x-rays and you know radiation and everything without knowing even if it is, where it is, how does it look, what type of cancer. So that's obvious to everybody. It's the same with addiction. You have to remember that even though sometimes it looks like we live in a total addictive society, everybody's addicted to something, it isn't true. No, everybody's not addicted. So that's very important to understand. And I think that's a confusing with the moderation therapy balloon too for addicts because people don't understand the difference between harmful use and addiction. So actually, if you go into a room with 100 people, uh, I could do this pretty quickly because of my experience without maybe using so many questions or tools. But uh, if you look at those 100 people, about a third would be what we call social users they enjoy a piece of chocolate or a piece of cake or, but nothing happens in the reward center. And they said, mm, tasted good, but it's so rich. I leave half. I mean, that's, they are normal. And, you know, we think they're crazy. Addicts think, how are they, how do they work? <laughs> Maybe you should study them and think what makes that happen? But their reward center is not affected in that way. See? Uh, then you have the second group, which we call, this is, you know, the medical language in my addiction world, social user, harmful use. They can have a tremendous amount of consequences, but they are the emotional eaters. Uh, they are the, uh, you know, uh, stress eaters. Uh, they are the party eaters, the cultural eaters. I mean, uh, you could ask them, why do you do this? They get a lot of negative consequences. They can be uh, overweight. Uh, they can have diabetes. Uh, they can have a poor microbiome stomach. They can have a lot of consequences, but they're not addicted. So if you tell them, hey, you're going to die if you keep eating like that, you have to cut down. They can use moderation. 
and you can teach them to, to switch from bad to good. Use this instead. You know, try this instead. Instead of eating when you're stressed, you know, take a walk, call somebody, uh, do deep breathing. So you can always help them to switch and they could improve their lifestyle tremendously. Addicts, you can never ask an addict, why do you drink? Why do you eat? Because they have to fake the answer because they are driven by the reward center to get the drug. So it's on a totally different level. And once the addiction is in place, it is, you know, just uh, chronic. It's for the rest of your life. Uh, it's progressive. It gets worse the more you use. Uh, and also by aging, because your reward center ages, right? So if you don't arrest it, you get sicker and sicker and sicker. And it is deadly. Sugar addiction is deadly. But it doesn't say sugar addiction on the dirt death certificate, it says the consequences from it, okay? So uh, that's why it's so important. Wait, so one yeah. quick question. So in your brain is, um, I mean, would you say that that damage to, or the, that the people who have that addiction, is it because of some damage that happened early on in the reward system and it set up the circumstances for addiction? And does that have anything to do with the poor quality of food that we're eating? So are we going to be birthing, um, you know, generations of more, you know, people who are more likely to be, have the, you know, this damage or problem with the reward system? Yeah, absolutely. The more you expose it, the more sensitive it gets. Absolutely. No doubt in my mind. That that's so we may happen. be seeing more than 30% of a room of 100 people being addicts, like yeah, in I another 10 today, years as we live in the Dorito. Yes, I think today oil. we have maybe 45, 50% could be addicted in a society today due to the junk food that we are exposed to. Okay. All right. That answers the question. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So, but a lot of people think that it has to be some kind of a trauma or a terrible childhood that makes you an addict. That's wrong. It's totally wrong. It's the sensitivity in the brain and its reaction to the drug. So and if the you, substance itself is really what, is what's yes. driving it. Yes, okay. definitely. Definitely. So uh, because a lot of therapists they try to uh, have talk therapy with addicts, you know, to try to help them to eat in moderation. That's the worst useless therapy you can ever go to. Uh, if you're an addict, you have to remove the drug. There's no other way to heal. Absolutely no other way. Totally removal of the drug. But that doesn't have to be with the harmful users. So that's why I developed the screening instruments on COPE, the six simple questions that would tell me it's probably a problem here. And then, so for everybody watching, I'll put the link down below and you can go test yourself and see where you are. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and then uh, the next thing is uh, you, I don't set a diagnosis like sugar addiction lightly on somebody. Uh, the, the instrument we have is 67 questions. It's a deep structured interview where I map your whole life but for, because most people say like this, oh, you're sugar addicted. How much did you eat? How often? That is not a diagnostic criteria, I'm telling you. It is what happens when you eat. Uh, somebody could eat very little sugar, very seldom, and be addicted. Somebody could eat a lot often and not be addicted. So that's why it is so important to understand, uh, one, with the instrument you get to know, or do you have the addiction? Do you have that illness? That's number one. Oh, number two, how does it look? How, does, how has it affected your whole life? Because once you see the curve and how it has affected your life, we can also start picking together what you need to do to recover. You know, it takes as long to walk out of the jungle as it took to walk into the jungle. And that's why it's so important to do this sugar interview uh, uh, and to do the follow-up interview. So it's a total process of about three, four hours. So that's very important. So we don't do this lightly. You know, this is serious business. So for so the that's people who, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so that's why we do it, you know, we want to do it serious. This is a diagnostic tool. It's not a screening instrument. 
So for the people who are watching this and can't get to you or can't be your client, like, I, you know, that seems really involved. What do they do? How, you know? Well, anyone can name me, email me anytime and I will put you in touch with the sugar professional. There's no, so we have them all over the world today. We have over 50 certified licensed professionals in the world today, and they are very skilled at treatment too. So they can make treatment plans. They can definitely help you. So if you email me, I promise to, you know, get you in touch with somebody. Okay, that's awesome. I have a long list. So just, yeah. you know, absolutely. And I I had interrupted you before when you were talking about like the internet and screen, well, the screen addiction and, and thinking about a diagnostic tool there, you were starting to say something about that. Yeah, that's why I work with addiction interaction disorder because I know that one addiction leads to another addiction. And the thing is that you have to, you know, take away everything that is activating your reward center and activating the addiction. And that's why it's important. I don't work with taking away sugar from somebody. I work with healing brains. I work with addiction, the addictive personality that has been due to the drug. You know, the drug have caused your brain to wire in the wrong way so that you don't have access to all the beautiful parts of your brain. It's immature. It hasn't been able to develop. It's like a house with a lot of uh, electrical cords drawn to all the rooms, but there is only electricity in a few of the little parts. So I want you to lit up the whole house, you know, to rewire your brain and lit up the whole house, because that's when you are free and happy and can create the life you want. So a you lot of people talk about a dopamine fast. That kind of sounds like what you're talking about. Dopamine fast? Yeah. So basically the idea is, um, I, you know, it sort of like started with in Silicon Valley, people were doing this, but sort of, you know, got popular on the internet, but basically, um, to take away all of the things that give you an unnatural level of pleasure, like, um, you know, TV watching the internet, the screen use drugs, alcohol, all of that. And, you know, for a specified time period, just do regular things so that you reset your brain and you can start to get pleasure from things like taking a walk or, you know, petting your cat that are supposed to give yeah. you pleasure. But when you're so used to the stimulation, the high stimulation of the internet or whatever, that you're not able to get that level of pleasure. Well, that's one way to describe it. You know, it's sort of like that. But there's so many other things you need to know about, you know, the, the addictive thoughts, addictive feelings, also false thoughts, false feelings, uh, false urges, which creates a crazy behavior. So there's a lot of things to know about that in order to go backwards. So, of course, we, we don't take away all the pleasures for somebody because you're not addicted to everything. Everybody's not addicted to everything. So the the point that I want to make is that we make sure that we look at what is, you know, addictive to you, what is causing the addiction, uh, which drugs do you need to remove, which behaviors do you need to improve, to adjust, to replace, uh, you know, so it's not like you, you go, because I think that could be maybe a dangerous way to sort of isolate you and take away everything, and if you don't get the tool how the addicted brain works, after a while, if you start going back, you'll be back in the same addiction and worse, because we know that the relapse is worse than it were when you quit all these things. So that's why you have to understand neuroscience and learn about it. So, you know, it's like, you know, if you take away some things, some things you can never take back, never, because that's going to kill you. So what can you replace it with? What kind of life could you create instead, a new behavior? And you know, the brain it gets a dopamine kick when you learn new things. And I also want to point one thing out. I know there's a lot of buzz and fuss about only dopamine. In you know, addiction, any addiction, it's a whole battery of neurotransmitters that are unbalanced. It's not only about dopamine. And you need to understand that it's about acetylcholine, serotonin, GABA, noradrenaline. So you need to keep, you need to really understand what you're doing because if you take one down, another one can shoot up and then you're unbalanced again. 
So how do you level out and balance so you have the joy of having all those beautiful neurotransmitters playing like the most beautiful symphony orchestra instead of like some kind of crazy electronic jazz that you threw stones into. Uh, that's what it is to be addicted, you know, or right. graven, not stones, yeah. but graven. Uh, but you, you, I think you understand what I mean, that it's much more to it. But there is a lot of, you know, quick fixes that pop up all the time. People think that, oh, if I fast or it's the same with food, you know, fasting would cure my addiction. No way. Haven't cured one on earth yet. Uh, so <laughs> you know, once you go back, you know what's going to happen, right? You know, it's worse than ever. So it's like the brain is thinking, oh my God, I better take my chance to eat now while I'm at it. So you go deeper down into the illness. So that's not a way to walk. It has to be about balance, knowledge, balance. It has to be one step at a time, baby steps, one day at a time. Uh, and of course, you're not being miserable during that time. We have a lot of tools today. We have biochemical repair. We work with sleep. We work with breathing. We have all kinds of tools to help you through that first part when the brain is going, give me my chocolate or whatever bread or whatever it was. You know, I think I'd die if I can't have it. Uh, we have tools to help people with that. Yeah, uh, That's the way you have to go, it, go at it, you know, and uh, knowledge is rebuilding your brain. So that is very, very important. Yeah. Wow. Well, <laughs> um, that's so much information. Um, so for the people, so we did a deep dive, like right into the heart of the matter, you know, the addiction, but um, let's, let's step back for a sec. So for the people who, um, you know, especially for the harmful use, but not necessarily addicted person, um, yeah. you know, let, let's talk about diet for a second. Where does low carb fit into it? And where does carnivore fit into it? What, what do you think of those dietary approaches? Why should we care about that? Um, and how does it, you know, impact the brain? Well, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, everybody's made to eat low carb, no matter, but there's a lot, there's, uh, and again, when we come into food and all this, you know, there's so many definitions, what is it? But I used to say, you know, we should probably eat like the 850 years ago or something, you know, when there weren't any processed or ultra processed or combination food. I used to, people, uh, I'm, I'm very tired of talking food after all these years because people always ask me, what should I eat? So I used to joke and say, you know, eat what's have in one ingredients. And they look at me shocked and say, what do you mean? When in, a, in an egg, there's only an egg. <laughs> in meat, there's only meat type thing, uh, sort of. Uh, you know, pure meat, pure food. I mean, pure ingredients and cook that. And low carb, uh, the simple fact is that our body is not made for carb load because it's going to start producing a lot of insulin. And we know today that insulin, I mean, is get, uh, the more insulin, the sicker you get. That's a fact. There is so many studies about that. You know, I'm thinking in Benjamin Bickman's book, Why We Get Sick. There are many, many, many more. And a lot of studies about that. What's going to happen when you have hyperinsulinemia and you get insulin resistant resistancy? I mean, you get sick. That's how it all starts. And then there are so many illnesses that comes from that tree type thing. So we know that. So nobody should actually argue that that we should eat low carb. We're not made to eat a lot of carbs. We've never been made to eat a lot of carbs. So to me, that's a fact. And then when we talk about keto, to me, the hype about keto is to measure ketones and uh, people that are addicted are obsessed with everything. So they become obsessed <laughs> and they measure ketones and they're totally you know, obsessed like this. And of, that gives it a bad reputation. I learned, I went to nursing school 1971 to 73. I learned about keto as the best treatment to give children with epilepsy butter, huge amounts of butter. Uh, so it started already then, it was sort of a, a medical thing, uh, but you know, you don't have to measure ketones and be crazy about uh, keto. Uh, I used to say low carb has a lot of dairy, but keep the butter and the ghee, but 
people that are addicted and insulin sensitive should take away whipped cream, cheese, sour cream, yogurt, and that type of thing, because it's going to give a burst of insulin. We see that people that stick to those dairy products, they don't lose weight. They still have cravings. They want more. Okay. So that has to go. And then you have keto. So keto is basically low carb, taking away those dairy products, keeping butter and ghee. So that's how simple it is for me. Then came along carnivore. And, you know, when I listen to people, I've tried carnivore myself. I feel beautiful on it. But, you know, I eat a mix between keto and carnivore. I have some veggies sometimes, you know. I love some uh, mashed, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, cauliflower. Uh, I can have some um, uh, green beans. Uh, today I had yellow wax beans. You know, I love that. Cook them in the oven with some oil and salt. Uh, I can have some of that with my meat. Uh, and then sometimes other times I eat only uh, carnivore, you know, and I feel beautiful on that. So uh, I think it has to do with, uh, you know, the amount of veggies we have been fooled to eat, fruit and veggies being like, you know, uh, the holy food and people have eaten so much and people don't understand. I love nature and I love David Attenborough and I love, you know, a lot of that science and stuff and space and all that kind of, I'm, I'm a geek for that. But, you know, when you learn about uh, I saw this uh, Ian Stewart, this professor at Dublin University, doing a documentary, How to Make it Earth. Have you seen it? Mm -mm. Oh, I love that one. I think it's three, four to five minutes. I love it. It's an old documentary, documentary. But, you know, he shows, and he's not into food, anything. He, I mean, he doesn't even know probably what low-carb keto is. Uh, and it's made quite some time ago. But, you know, he's telling how they have so much poison all the, the uh, veggies and, and um, trees and everything has poison to defend itself. It doesn't want to be eaten and die. It want to reproduce. Then you start wondering, oh, wait a minute. You know, what if I eat this? And the other thing that was important for me was that many, many years ago, actually about 20 years ago, I had this dietitian. She must have had guts. I mean, you know, uh, they they <laughs> are very hard to convert. But anyway, she came to my training, uh, some classes I did, and she said that don't eat canola oil, or I don't know, do you call it safflower oil? No, it's canola, same. yeah. Canola, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and we said, why? We thought that was very healthy. No, that that herb or that you know plant is very toxic. So it has to go through a tremendous amount of processes to remove the toxins and you can't remove them all anyway. So we are not made to eat those. And that's it triggered something in me. And I started thinking, you know, and then spinach and oxalate and phytate and anti-nutrients and on and on. And I saw people, some people eating huge amount of veggies. I saw how sick they were in their stomach. They were incredible sick. And they had a lot of inflammatory illnesses, like I could connect fibromyalgia, uh, osteoarthritis, uh, you know, um, what do you call it? Sinus infections, chronic sinus infections, and a lot of allergies. And all these little pieces in a puzzle made me start thinking. So, you know, when I heard about that, I started to eat less and less veggies. And of course, I was the bad person. And then I didn't eat fruit because it's a lot of sugar. And then I was crazy again. I can have some berries. Some We have wild blueberries and raspberries here. So that I can have a little bit now and then. Nothing happens. But, you know, uh, I won't go to the store and buy an apple. You know how those look today? This is just yeah. a sugar bomb, you know, or whatever. But anyway, so all these pieces in the puzzle, it's because I'm so old and been around for so long and seen and listened to so much <laughs> that, you know, you add things up. So when people started saying, you know, first of all, I remember when you didn't have to eat breakfast, I was the happiest in the world because I never liked breakfast. I never liked breakfast and I could skip breakfast. And I thought that was finally, <laughs> how many years do you think I forced myself to eat breakfast because it was supposed to be healthy. Horrible, I wish I hadn't known that. But anyway, and it was the same with veggies and fruit and all that. I became healthier 
when I cut down on veggies. I, uh, when I went into my menopause at 48, so that's 20 years ago, 21 almost, I had osteoarthritis. And that I think today is due to all the veggies I ate. Nobody can prove that or prove against it or whatever you want to prove or prove not. But, you know, I don't care. That's uh, the way I feel. And I had joint pain. Not, I didn't have the dangerous systemic rheumatoid arthritis. It's important to know. Uh, but and then at that time, they say that, you know, osteoarthritis uh, was, uh, you know, uh, what do you call that? Wear and tear. And I said, you know, well, listen, I don't wear and tear my body. I wear and tear my brain. So how can I have pain in my thumbs and my fingers and all that? It doesn't make sense. It was that inflammatory process. I'm sure of it. Mm -hmm. And that went away. So was, was that enough answer? Long answer or short <laughs> question? <laughs> yeah, no, I absolutely. Think I think that people that do have health problems on low carb should go keto. If you still have health problems on keto, go carnivore. You have nothing yeah. to lose to try it. Nothing to lose. Yeah, I mean, I, I loved keto and it really made a huge difference for me, but it didn't, you know, so I was able to lose weight on it, and, but I was not able to get like the massive healing that I kept hearing everybody talk about. And it wasn't yeah. until I went carnivore and took out dairy that instantly, yep. you know, my, yep. my asthma cleared up, but, you know, yep. uh, yeast infections cleared up, like, mm -hmm. you know, pain was gone, inflammation gone. So, you know, and one other thing people eat a lot of that they should take away is nuts and seeds, mm -hmm. nuts and seeds. That's a big killer. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of omega six of those uh, fatty acids that is supposed to be good for you, but cause a lot of inflammation. Well, Todd, can you talk to me about artificial sweeteners and where that sits, especially for the person who is dealing with sugar addiction? Can you have your Lily's chocolate and, you know, and have that sweet well, without? If you're an addict, if you're sugar addicted, you can't have any substitutes, period. Gone bye-bye. And chocolate, remember that chocolate contains uh, something called amandamide which has a drug-like effect on us. So that's a drug. So even if you eat cocoa from on a dry cocoa with a spoon, uh, you can be addicted to that. So if you mix that with uh, sweeteners or you know dairy products or whatever it is mixed with, you have a bomb. So we can't have keto bread, we cannot have keto desserts because that's gonna trigger, you know, a big time. Uh, and we have are in the relapse before we know it. So a sweeteners, you know, anything that is sweet on your tongue will start insulin release. And also we could start getting insulin release when we see things. So, you know, the food porn that we see today with the cakes and the goodies and everything in the stores, I call that. Yeah, food I had porn. to get off of Pinterest. You know, the food it's porn very is real. Dangerous, <laughs> very dangerous for an addict because that's going to trigger the reward center and you might not know it two, until two, three, four days later. So once you look at it, you think, oh, well, I don't really care. I don't want it. Three days later, you go on a binge and you think, where did that come from? Because uh, we used to say about the illness, it's uh, cunning, baffling, powerful, and very patient. That little monster, which I call the red dog, you know, the nasty part of us, that can be like the cutest... Look at this, what I have here in the basket, see? Oh. <laughs> it's yeah. a tiny, tiny little chihuahua. She's hardly two pounds and she looks like a doll, right? The red dog could sleep like that in the basket for a long, long time. And then suddenly you are tired, you are at the low, you get exposed to seeing this stuff and it starts sniffing. Oh boy, oh boy. And two days later, you sit there and munch on it and you don't know what happened. So, you know, some people have used sweeteners when they detox, you know, to don't do the really cold turkey, cut it out. And they have been able to handle that. But that's a, a type of a detox over maybe a couple of weeks. So if you keep that in your food plan somehow, you know, you're going to fall sooner or later. And I'm talking addicts, not harmful users. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So that's yeah. important. Yeah. So the person, you know, so I, I mean, I hear a lot of people like get really um, hard line with sweeteners and, um, you know, I, I mean, for me, I, I say to people, you kind of, you kind of have to see for yourself and, um, you know, some people can handle them and some people can't. And if you find that you keep slipping, keep having cravings, like <clears throat> you, you keep having trouble, like getting your act together, then yeah. you, you got to look at it. But you know, there are other people who are, you know, who seem to be fine. And I'm like, I I don't know why. (laughs) Lucky you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Most people I know have to take them away uh, at one point in their life because it's, it starts adding up on them and they start, you know, uh, obsessing and thinking about the real stuff and they start trying one bite and then the second bite and so on, you know, and back you go in a huge relapse. That's what I see more than anything than that a few people that can handle it, you know, in maybe small amounts. Uh, So, and and I always say too, that we are biochemically unique. So there is no way to tell somebody exactly how the best food plan or amounts, or I used to call it the fuel mix. You know, I cannot tell you the fuel mix. Uh, I can tell you what type of food you can eat from, you know, here are the ingredients, the proteins, the fats, and, you know, the the small carb amounts, if you don't want to do a carnivore, I can give you a list of that, a shopping list type thing, but how to put it together, it has to be up to you, and the thing we can use is a food journal, you know, that you write down, But the problem with a lot of the food addiction treatment in the old days was that they were messing around with feelings. And in the beginning, you have false feelings. You know, you feel miserable and you think you eat because you're miserable, but actually you're miserable because of the drug and the drug causes the miserable feelings. So, I mean, that's going to be a vicious circle downhill. So the, the thing that I think we should focus on and measure is energy. What's your energy level? What's your energy level after breakfast, if you eat breakfast, okay? What's your energy level between lunch and dinner? Uh, And a lot of people say, oh, I'm so depressed uh, because of this, but I think it is low energy. I'm not sure it is really depression. Uh, And I think it is anxiety due to what I call volatile blood sugar. The blood sugar goes up and down in your brain and your brain goes, wait a minute, what am I gonna do, help? You know, so uh, that's what's causing anxiety. And then you eat because you think you eat because you think you ate on the anxiety, but actually the food you ate caused anxiety. So I used to say, uh, you know, put the horse in front of the wagon. That's much smarter than putting the cart in front of the horse. Uh, so you know, you have to learn to see what's uh, the hen or the egg in a way. You know, when did it start? Why uh, do I act like this? What happened if I take it away? And if you then start thinking about what drains you of energy, because sugar gives you false energy in a very short, it's like rocket fuel, right? Boom, up you go. And then, you know, it's gone. And then you crash. And then you need to do that again. And that's going to destroy your brain and your body. So uh, the trick is to start watching how your energy races. So it, when you do a food journal, measure your energy. Think about it as a thermometer, you know, 10 high energy, balance, level, perky, blah, blah, blah. You know, one, ugh, I want to go to bed. I can't even. <laughs> and then I love not- that you say that. Because when no, I first started keto, like I, um, I just decided, like, I didn't want to carry around snacks anymore. You know, I'd spent my whole life having to plan yeah. out breakfast, lunch, dinner, oh, and snacks. Yeah. So I oh. just said, let me figure out what I can eat in three meals that will keep me full for the, you yes. know, or satisfied yes. through the whole day. And that is actually kind of what led me to keto because I discovered scrambled eggs and bacon. bacon works. A muffin yeah. does not. Yeah, egg and bacon works beautiful. I used to take that on the airplane, fried eggs with bacon. I love it. I carry that as a, a, a snack, I, not a snack, as a meal because I don't snack. Because I, snacking is the biggest myth in the world. That's the food industry's way to make you eat more. So you eat more and then you eat more, right? So that's very dangerous. So let's focus on energy level because I have figured out what people come to me and they have all these 
signs, you know, uh, symptoms of depression. And then I used to look at them and say, do you think you're really depressed or could it be energy loss on the cellular level? That's the question I used to ask. And they look shocked at me. What did you say? Energy loss at the cellular level. But that's exactly how I feel. Nobody said that before. I am bone tired. Yeah, you don't, you have the wrong fuel mix, total wrong fuel mix. So this is how we start, you know, adjusting. We work on sleep. I love the conscious breathing technique that I work with. You know, my relaxator, I tape my mouth at night. I love that. You know, everything is to increasing energy because when my energy is level and high and it doesn't mean I have to be like this, but I have energy. I love doing everything. I'm never depressed. Everything is fun. You know, walking the dog in the rain. I don't care. I have energy. But just, if I don't have an energy, lifting a pen is horrible. Uh, everything would be horrible. TV is horrible. Knitting is horrible. Food is horrible. Blah, blah, blah. So it's all about energy. So that's what I advise anyone listening now. Start noticing your energy. Do the thermometer. Start listening. And if you're low on energy, you know, like what I do in the afternoon, if my energy dips in the afternoon, I take a salt shot. I take a teaspoon of sea salt and a big glass of water. 10 minutes later, whoop, because you need salt for, your, for the neurotransmitters in your brain. It doesn't work otherwise. And think about it. What have they scared us for? Being in the sun, eating butter, eating meat, salt. Okay, so I, I, Joe can say I'm an oppositor. I do the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, you know, that's crazy. All the natural things. I remember, you know, when I was a kid, I loved the salty fish we had. We didn't have, well, we, we started to have refrigerators and freezers. Then I'm born 52, but you know, it wasn't really common. So what did we eat? You cured pork, cured fish, and I loved it. And then one day salt was dangerous, gonna kill you, give you hypertension. And so they blamed salt for what sugar did. And I remember enjoying James D. Nicol Antonio's book, The Salt Fix. Have you read it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. he wrote about the Scandinavians eating all this salt fish. And, and I nodded all the time and said, Yeah, we did. I loved it. I loved it. You know. So, and that's yeah, why I, I love loved. that you, you talk about that and that he wrote that book because I absolutely see, you know, one of the biggest obstacles to people's success is getting enough salt. And I, I remember I, I was working with someone who said, you know, I'm working really hard, but I have this addiction to salt and I just can't break it. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> no, no, you are doing fine. Yes, so. you're doing fine. And, you know, um, if you, the less salt you eat, the more sugar you're going to eat because it causes sugar cravings. Yeah, that's the name of the game. And sugar doesn't raise insulin the way uh, 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 salt doesn't raise insulin, of course, sugar does. And that's yeah. what's going to kill you in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. let's yeah. do opposite. Let's get a, a beef, uh, uh, put a lot of salt and butter on it and eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, I feel like my, well, I mean, of course, everyone thinks their generation is, is it, but I feel like my generation is the last one where we still have a foot in both worlds. So I was born in 71. And so, you know, my mom would send me back to my grandparents and my grandmother would cook, you know, her lamb chops or steaks. And then you yes. know, she always said, you'd have to have a starch, a vegetable and a meat on your plate. And, you know, so there, it was meat and butter heavy and she just, you know, laid on the butter. And then, you know, yeah. on my mom's side, it was like the, you know, poached chicken breast and, low fat everything and all of that. So I kind of had a foot in both worlds, but I, I feel sorry for people who, you know, never had that opportunity to even know what it feels like to be satisfied by a meat meal. Me too. And one other thing, I've been out traveling around Sweden for many years, giving uh, lectures to the public. And, uh, you know, I have a few uh, scenes like the one I'm gonna describe, which I love. There's an old, old couple coming in you know there's a lot of young people 
uh, skinny women and overweight women, most women, and then always this little couple. They are so cute, they're holding hands, coming in, sitting on the front row, watching everything I say like this. She is overweight, he's skinny. Okay, so anyway, and then I come to the butter. I have a slide where I show, you know, what they scared us for, and I said, eat butter. And usually, you know, you see this scene, I've seen it in front of me so many times. He pushes his elbow into her and he whispers pretty loud, see, I'm right, we should eat butter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he eats butter and she doesn't. She eats bread and rolls and pasta and all that because that's, she thinks that's healthy. I mean, it's incredible. I wish somebody could make a documentary and film this scene because it's so, so obvious what's going on. Yeah. yeah. So I have a, another question. Um, yeah. Is there, uh, so, you know, you talked about with the artificial sweetener, one of the ways it yeah. is a problem, you know, is triggering, well, yes. the sweet taste is triggering, yes. you know, the brain to start releasing insulin. And insulin. There yeah. are some studies showing it triggers insulin too. And of course, mm -hmm. insulin up, sugar, blood sugar down, craving up. Yeah. Right. Okay. So is it, so I get the sweet taste part, but is um, mimicking a shape or a type of food also, could it be triggering? Because I know you said yes. something about keto bread. Now people yes. make the protein sparing modified bread, which is just um, egg whites and cream of tartare. Is, is just the format of bread enough to trigger somebody who- Absolutely. And, and okay. keto desserts, keto desserts and keto bread is usually a very, very bad trigger. You know, the seed cake, seed um, biscuits that people do, mm -hmm. the keto, uh, all that kind of keto is usually triggering sugar addicts on a binge, a relapse and binge. So it's very mm -hmm. triggering. Yeah, anything that reminds of, you know, the favorite drug. And of course, yeah. if you were a bread or pasta lover, you know, all these uh, fake pasta or bread, uh, will probably trigger you in the long run. Like I could not eat sugar-free keto chocolate because I was a chocolate and ice cream lover. lover. So that <clears throat> I know I tried many years ago, I really tried, but you know, I didn't stay there because it didn't give the real bus, but it gave a half bus. So it was like teasing my system. Yeah. So I had to yeah. run for the real thing to you know saturate my system and then i was in a relapse and then i had to climb all up again and that's how to do Ooh, i don't yeah. want to do that ever again so of course it does yes okay um you know because i wonder like i see people making like um hamburgers or you know uh sandwiches making the you, you know using the protein spread modified bread which is technically carnivore and, you know, part of me is like, oh, yeah, it would be really cool to have like a bun and, you know, just eat like I remember eating. But then the other part of me is like, I wonder if that would. Um, I wouldn't do would it. I wouldn't that. do it. Okay. It's a texture. It's a texture okay. and the fake bread. So you want to go for the real thing sooner or later. So gotcha. I think it is my, I, I do a, a hamburger wrap or I can uh, go to a hamburger restaurant. There are some here that have good meat. Um, uh, but you know, I can have lettuce. I take a lettuce uh, to hold it in, I, like a wrap. Mm -hmm. I do wraps yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, wow, that's really, uh, really helpful. And I think that people are really going to find a lot, a lot of value in, um, you know, today's conversation. So, um, so for people who are struggling and, you know, kind of need to figure out what to, to do for themselves, they can go to your website. They can reach out Absolutely. to you. Send me an email. I promise to answer. Even if it isn't in an instant, as soon as I can, I, I always answer. Sometimes it takes a week, one week or two weeks, but you know, I will answer. Mm -hmm. I will forward, I will, uh, put them in touch with people that can help them. Mm -hmm. And then to. you you said you don't see um, patients anymore. What do you do now? Okay, what is your thing? Well, uh, 2012, I drowned in patients. Uh, I was, you know, on the verge of just feeling sick, not feeling that I had the time or strength to answer everybody uh, screaming for help. You know, it was too much. Uh, so 
I figured I need colleagues. So I started to train people that was interested in becoming, you know, certified in doing the sugar assessment and certified in working with treatment, you know. So that's my, uh, the two trainings I do is just the sugar certification for professionals. And then I do a holistic addiction medicine training, a one year online training for professionals and, you know, teach them how to start working with clients and helping people. So that's what we do. So many, many years ago, you know, I read the poem or heard the poem about the starfish thrower uh, in a lecture. Do you know which one I mean? Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, there's many versions on the internet, but the version that I heard at that time, long time ago, was that it was this little young girl uh, walking on the beach and it's been a storm. So there were thousands of starfish dying on the beach. And she was walking and throwing one by one back in the water to save them. And then there came an older person and said to her, you can't save all these. And, and said to her, so that's not going to make a difference. And then she picked up one more and she threw it in and she said, it's going to make a difference for this one. So, you know, and I love that story. I just, uh, it, it touched so much in me being a nurse, uh, very empathetic, wanting to help everybody, you know, sad dogs and humans and cats and you name it. <laughs> thought, that's, you know, me. So I thought, you know, uh, that's going to save me from burnout to keep that metaphor within me. And I've done that for many years. And then my wingman, Buddy Adal, the, the man I work closely with, with the sugar, he uh, heard that and we started working with that concept, thinking that that's what we want to do. We teach people how to throw starfish. Well, we, for, we throw starfish so they know how to throw starfish so they know how to throw starfish. So that's yeah. what we do. And, and uh, I have, uh, I don't know where I put it now. But when, when I have, no, wait a minute. Huh. Oh, here it is. Um, I have this cup. Oh, there. <laughs> I'm a proud starfish that. thrower. And then you have a starfish here. And we have oh. a t-shirt with this. So we actually going to start a website. And anyone that throws starfish, I want to be there. So I want, you can have your website there. A link to you because you throw starfish so let's help each other to throw starfish and if we help each other you and i give each other energy you we give others energy you know uh, in that way we prevent burnout uh, we can spread the message in a very very good way one starfish at a time so to speak so that's the purpose of it and that's why i started doing the training and, um, you know, so that's what I enjoy so much in life now at my age. And the experience I have is to share that and to create new starfish out there that well, new people that would throw starfish. Yeah. Wow. So that's what we do. Training, professional training. I love that. Yeah. So if, so if you want to do, if you listen to this and want to do training, email me. <laughs> Oh, okay, fantastic. I know that there's a lot of people in the community who um, have recovered their health and now are looking for more ways to give back and share this information yeah. in the community. So this yeah. is definitely much needed. And, uh, yeah. you know, with, uh, well, I don't know, my whole family, I, people are addicted to sugar throughout, sweet tea, whatever their thing is, they've got their thing, but you know, know. Cannot, uh, cannot get off of it. So this is really helpful information. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. I know how the and, word looks today. Like. Addictive society. Woo. Yeah, I know. It's so, I mean, when you say that, like, you know, 30% of the population, maybe even as much as 45 or 50%, I think, I don't know how that is. Because everywhere I look, I see people that to me, you know, scream like sugar addiction. So I don't know. Um, maybe I just nobody, am not running in the right circles. Well, yeah, nobody, no, no, nobody, no, I, I said that maybe that's uh, some years ago at a nurse's uh, fair, I did the uncope, you know, the six simple questions. Uh, well, this is, let's say 15 years ago. Uh, then a third were normal users, a third had harmful use and the third were sugar addicts. But I would think that the two um, the normal use and uh, harmful use are a much lesser group today. 
And because sugar is such a dangerous, potent, toxic drug, like it's unbelievable. It's the worst drug we have on the planet today. And it is everywhere. You're exposed to it all the time, you know? Uh, so I think that probably a much higher, maybe 60%, I don't know. I, I, you know, I'm just guessing, I don't know, but I see the same as you. Wherever I go, I see people that are sick from sugar, mm. everywhere I go. Yeah. So and that's we didn't even dive into your story. So um, I, I would, you know, well, I, for I everybody who's watching, I just want to say your story has been, uh, you know, was a, so inspirational and, and helpful. So um, I, you know, I know it, it's late in the interview to just ask you to, to yeah. do that, but um, I would encourage everybody watching to, you know, check out some of the other interviews because your oh, story. Yeah, I told really my fantastic. story on so many platforms. So it's out there. So if you want to know my story, I started five years old, stealing sugar lumps, you know, uh, it's, mm -hmm. I've told it many, many times. So it's out there. Yeah. Yeah. So I know, I know what this is all about. Yeah. Sorry, you know, my my interview skills sometimes go out the window. No, I'm no, no. so excited I'm so to ask my questions. <laughs> but, you know, I'm so happy I didn't have to tell my story again because I've done it so many times and it's out there to listen to. So we could take it in another direction. And I really enjoyed that. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So everybody watching, thank you so much for listening in. I hope that you take this information to heart and you use it. Um, everyone who uh, you, uh, your friends or family members who, you know, could benefit from this information, please share the video and I will see you all next week. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much. Remember you having a sensitive brain is a superpower and you do have a tremendous amount of strength, much more than you think you can do it.